When I was in high school, the, the school always, they had this annual trip to Six Flags, and the particular year that my, my friends and I went, it, there was at least three or four busloads of, of kids that went to Six Flags, and during the course of the day, we found ourselves in the Midway section of Six Flags, that's where they have all those carnival games that you can't win, and my group of friends just happened to be there at the same time this other group of, of, of young ladies from our school happened to be there, and there's this one particular girl, she was, she was pretty cute, and my friend, he wanted to win one of those big stuffed animals for her, but he didn't have any money, so he said, hey Paul, can I borrow a dollar? Yeah, sure, here you go. Yeah, of course he didn't win. Can I borrow another dollar? Can I borrow another dollar? Pretty soon I had loaned him eleven dollars. Uh, but he won. He won that stuffed animal for that cute girl. And uh, he said, I'll pay you back. I'll pay you back. I was like, f f fair enough, fair enough. Next week, next week we're sitting in the cafeteria across from each other and I said, hey, um, do you by chance have that eleven dollars that I, I loaned you at Six Flags? And he goes, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll pay you back next week. Fair enough. Next week, there we are sitting in the cafeteria, all my friends, and I, I say to him, hey, um, so do, do you have that $11 that I, that I loaned you? He goes, yeah, yeah, just stop pestering me. I'll, I'll get it to you. Fine, fair enough. Week goes by. There we are sitting in the cafeteria again. And I say, so do you have that $11 or what? Is this going to happen? He goes, dude, why, why do you keep asking me for this $11? I said, because you promised that you would pay me back. That's why I'm asking for my money. What would you do at this point? How, how, would, you, how would you respond to your friend who now appears to be not so much of a friend anymore? I suppose the better question would be to ask is, how would Jesus have me show love to my friend who has quickly become not so much my friend? In our reading today, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, God did command that first part, love your neighbors. Uh, but the second part, the part about hating your enemies, that, that had been manipulated by the, the Jewish religious leaders of Jesus' day. See, what they had done was they had taken that word neighbor and they, had, they thought that it meant, well, anybody that belongs to our nation of Israel, people that, that who worship the same way that we do. And, and then in addition to that, it would be anybody who we consider to be a friend. That, that's our neighbor. And what they had done is they, had inf they thought that God had inferred then, well, then everybody else, that we can count them as our, as our enemy. And we have the right to, uh, to actually hate them and get back at them if they do something to us. Do we do that? Do we manipulate God's command, love your neighbor, and say, well, <laughs> who do you mean by that, Lord? Do we pick and choose to whom we show love and those whom we shun? And even, and even say to the Lord, yes, I have the right to get even with them if they hurt me, because after all, they, they hurt me. I have rights. I have the right to get back at them. In fact, God himself said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Right? God did say that. But he gave that rule, he gave that law, that regulation to his people Israel. Because when your neighbor was on the receiving end of injustice, he wanted to make sure that the punishment fit the crime and didn't go past that, didn't go beyond that, because God knows the sinful human heart. If injustice was done, there should, the, the, the punishment should fit the crime, right? And besides, God also allowed you to pay a fine instead of physical maiming, instead of having your eye gouged out because you your, your ox or your goat actually accidentally gouged out the neighbor's eye, your eye didn't have to be gouged out. You could pay a fine. And the magistrate, the local magistrate, would handle this. But Jesus' point is the, the punishment was not to be done personally. But see, again, this, is, this had been corrupted by the religious leaders in Jesus' day. There was a certain sect 
of the Pharisees that did not allow for forgiveness at all. They took that literally and insisted that revenge be taken into their own hands. If somebody slaps you in the face, then you slap them back. If somebody steals from you, you make sure that you get back what they stole from you and then you make them pay on top of it. Jesus said, if someone strikes you, let them strike you in the, the other side of the face. Now, to be clear, Jesus is not condoning abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, domestic. That is not okay. Jesus is not saying that. If that is the case, we need to protect and preserve life. We need to tell someone and let the courts and the judges handle it. And if they don't get it right, then God says, then you leave it into the hands of the Almighty Maker because He promises that He's going to deal with those who continue to mistreat others. But Jesus' point is, it is not your right to seek personal revenge. Even if it means setting aside what you think is right and fair. He said, this is the way you live. He says, be perfect. Be perfect in loving all of your neighbors. And that includes your enemies. Yes, even those who hurt you and take advantage of you. And to drive the point home, then Jesus describes the situation. And as he begins to describe it, you can hear the, the group of his disciples who have gathered with him on the hillside just groaning. Like, oh yeah, Jesus, I know what you're talking about. The part about going a mile with somebody and then going two miles. Okay, so in Jesus' day, a Roman soldier could conscript you, ordinary citizen, to carry his rucksack for a mile. You had to do it. Didn't matter where you were going, what business you had, if you had to meet somebody. It didn't matter. You had to carry his gear for a mile. Jesus said, you go an extra mile. You go with him two miles. That's how you show love to all neighbors, yes, even your enemies. And the reason Jesus said that is because, again, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they had this provision. And they said that if you studied the Word of God full-time, if you were a disciple of a rabbi, if you were a rabbi, if you were a Pharisee, if you were a teacher of the law, if you were a priest, you didn't have to do this. Because we're not going to subject ourselves to the government. We're not going to let the government tell us we have to do this for their soldiers. But Jesus will not have his disciples insist on this privilege. He said, willingly comply rather than offend the government whom God has appointed. But there's a part of me, and part of you, if you're like me, that says that here's this, what Jesus is demanding, and that, that makes uncommon sense. Because if somebody wrongs me, if they hurt me, if they cheat me, if they're unfair to me, then my, my right is to get back at them, right? I feel that I have that right. I have the right to be angry and to hold a grudge against the bully at my school. I have the right to be cold and uncaring with my colleague or co-worker who was unfair to me in the workplace. I have the right to speak abrasively against someone who does not share my political views or who belongs to that other political party. I have the right to vent my frustrations against my HOA on social media. I have the right to give the silent treatment to those who offend me. I have the right to get what is owed to me and make sure that they hurt and they suffer for it. That's the way I think. So we go back to my friend in high school. Our friendship was not so friendly after that. In fact, it got to be downright mean and nasty, and we almost started swinging punches at each other after algebra class one day. Then we're in the cafeteria again. He's sitting across from me. I watched him pay for his lunch with his own money and put the change back in his wallet so I knew that he had the money. So I said to him, look, are you going to pay me that money or what? 
And one of my other friends was sitting there, and he had heard this over the past month. And he said, dude, how much does he owe you? And I said, $11. So he pulled out his own wallet, took out a 10 and a 1, and he threw it at me, and he said, there you go. And I threw the money back at him, and I said, I can't take your money. And he said, why not? He said, debt's paid. Just take it. It was at that moment that I felt embarrassed and ashamed that I'd gotten so worked up that this $11 in what he owed me, I let that consume me. I had the right to ask for that money back. I had loaned it freely. He had taken advantage of me. But it was $11. I didn't need it to pay for my next meal. I didn't need it to help pay the family bills at home. Jesus says, be perfect in loving your neighbor. And those words from Jesus expose my heart. I, I pray that they expose your heart too. When I insist on my right to get even, to hold a grudge, to get what's coming for me, what I do is I willingly and consciously set aside God's love for self-love. I come to Jesus as a broken sinner and he lifts up my head as he lifts up yours and he says, but I want you to look. Look at, look at what I did for you. My friends, look at Jesus and look at how he loved. If there's anyone in the, in, in the history of the world who, who had the right to, uh, to complain, it was Jesus. Well, first of all, first of all before I get to that, it, he regarded everybody, every single person as his neighbor, even his enemies, even those who hated him. And he loved them all equally. And then if anyone had a right to complain in the history of the world, it, it was Jesus. Because here's a guy who was arrested illegally, detained illegally, was put on trial illegally, and when he was sentenced to death, there was nothing, there was no evidence that they had against him. He was innocent. But what do we hear from Jesus? Do, do we hear him calling mistrial? Do we have him rising up against his, his government? Do we have him calling on his followers to rise up against and fight the government? No, not at all. But he endures it all patiently and quietly. He doesn't say a thing. And then, and then, they forced him to carry his cross, which honestly wasn't his to carry. That was my cross and your cross. It was my cross of my shame and my guilt, and your cross of failing to love your neighbors, failing to love even your enemies, as Jesus asks. That's what's not fair. That's what's not right. I, I'm the one that should have been put on trial. You, you both of us, uh, we are the ones who, who should have said, you're the guilty one. You're the one who deserves to die and, and we receive our just punishment. That's what's fair. But God does what's not fair and, and puts this on Jesus and Jesus carries my cross and he takes your cross and he takes it all the way up to the top of that hill and dies and he pays that punishment, debt paid. And the result, oh, the result is these beautiful words that we heard in the psalm of the day uh, from Psalm three, uh, 103. The psalm writer says, Praise the Lord. Well, why do we do that? Well, He forgives all your sins. He redeems your life. The Lord is compassionate. He is gracious. He is slow to anger. He is abounding in love. And he does not treat us as our sins deserve. Nor does he repay us according to our iniquities. But as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. God does not treat us the way we ought to be treated. But instead he, he treats us with something that just doesn't make sense. He causes his son to suffer and die for us and forgives us. 
And having been forgiven, then Jesus says, Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, if we translate this from the original language of the Greek, it, Jesus literally says, You will be perfect. That's what he's li literally saying. You will be perfect in the way that you love your neighbors and your enemies. And we hear that and we say, yes, of course I'm going to do that because that's who I am and that's who you are. The righteousness of Christ has been credited to your account through faith. The love that Jesus had for all people, yes, even his enemies, has been credited to you. That's how God sees you, as holy and perfect in his sight. And so when Jesus says, you will love your enemies, you will love your neighbors, we say, yes, yes, we will. Because that's how God made us, and that's what he made us to do. So then we ask, well, how do we do that? Well, we treat people the way that God treats people. Jesus said he causes his sun to shine on the evil and the good. He causes rain to fall on the unrighteous and the righteous. God dispenses uncommon blessings indiscriminately. We will do the same. And Jesus himself said, if you love just your friends, what are you doing that's more than what everybody else does? The tax collectors who were the scum of society in Jesus' day, they loved people. The pagans, that is the heathen unbelievers, they showed love to people too. He said, if you do that just for your friends, what more are you doing than other people are doing? But God has made you more and expects more from you. So be perfect in the way that you love all of your neighbors. And the Apostle Paul gave us a great list of how to do that, didn't he, in the second reading? He said, honor one another above yourselves, which means I'm going to set aside my personal pride. Do not be proud, but be humble. He said, be patient in affliction. He said, be faithful in prayer. That means pray for your enemies and even write their name down on your personal prayer list and pray for them by name. He says, share with God's people who are in need as God enables you. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. He says, live in harmony with one another. Live at peace with everyone. And remember that Paul said, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with everyone. Not, it's not on them. It's up to you to live at peace with all people, even your enemies. Paul said, do not repay anyone evil for evil. If the courts and the judges get it wrong, you let God handle it. He promises that he will. He says, be careful to do what is right. Overcome evil with good. The bottom line is, let love rule the day. And my friends, what's the result when we live this way? The result is that you are the peacemakers in your home, in your schools, with your HOA, in your community, in your church. And if you are the peacemakers and you are the ones who love your neighbors and even that includes your enemies, you live this way, what's going to happen? Might there be less stress, less confrontation, more peace, more unity that everybody keeps talking about that we need? Doesn't that start with, with us right here? Engaging people one-on-one -on -one with this love that God has for us even to the point of loving our enemy. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul said, uh, when your enemy's hungry, give him food, and when he's thirsty, give him water to drink, and in so doing, you heap burning coals on his head. Because when your enemy mistreats you and, you and you respond with love, that bit about heaping burning coals on his head, he's realizing that the way you live is a better way to live. A life of love. And when he or she asks you why you live in that way, you get to tell them, well, let me tell you about Jesus' love for you. So my friends, you will love. You will love all your neighbors because that's who you are and that's what God made you to be. God grant it to us for Jesus' sake. Amen. We now worship our God with our offerings. Thank <laughs> you.